Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today, I just wanted to answer this simple question of why don't I shoot Astro from my backyard anymore? There are a couple good reasons. First reason being I'm living in an apartment right now and I don't have a backyard. The second two reasons are a bit more interesting. <laughs> so primarily the reason why I don't shoot from my backyard for doing Deep Sky Astro anymore is that it ends up being a waste of money for me to shoot from a place that's not clear enough. And that's really what it boils down to. When you're considering an astrophotography, you need the most time imaging possible for the best images possible. And that's what I'm going after, just the best images. Then you need to be able to use your telescopes that you worked hard and spent all this money on at the highest efficiency possible, which means you need to be throwing down the most hours you physically can to actually, you know, get a return or to actually use these things in a good way, in a, in a productive way. I wanna break down kind of the costs and why exactly it is that it's more expensive for me to shoot in a backyard versus at an observatory. And this is probably, you know, a bit different for me versus the amateur just doing astrophotography. So if you're out there and you're just an amateur Fear not, you can still shoot excellent images from your backyard and you really don't need to think about moving your stuff into a remote observatory, but this is just explaining my thought process behind my images and why for me it's just not worth it anymore from a backyard. So basically, for those who are unaware, a remote observatory is just a location which has infrastructure to support hosting a telescope. So. You'll leave your telescope there on a pier or on your tripod and it will live there permanently in a dark sky site with good seeing. And every night that it's clear, you're gonna be able to shoot without dealing with the setup or a bunch of the other headaches. Of course, this all comes at a little bit extra cost, but for the way I factor things, it's really less cost than what I would suffer from just shooting in my backyard. And this all boils down to the fact that these instruments that we pay for are so expensive that if you factor in the cost to how much time you're actually using them, then, you know, it becomes <laughs> almost wasteful, at least for, for my equations, it becomes wasteful for me to use it in a place where I can't be using it all the time. And that's kind of one of the sad things about astrophotography is that not every place is born equal for shooting. It's very location dependent. And sometimes if you're not living in the right spot, then it just doesn't make as much sense to do. You know, you wouldn't be an astrophotographer in the Amazon rainforest, you know, <laughs> or uh, I'm sure there are astrophotographers in Portland or Seattle, but you know, if it's raining 90% of the year and you buy an expensive telescope, it, you have to kind of ask yourself, what was the point? How much are you even using this thing to justify spending X amount of money on it? So that's basically where the equation comes in from in my head. I'll explain how this all started for me, remote observing. So I happened to grow up in a pretty lucky place. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. And in Phoenix, we were probably getting 300 clear nights per year on average, which in effect is basically like a remote observatory, but in my parents' backyard. I was still setting up, but I was getting, you know, these highly efficient years where I could throw down big amounts of time. And then I started moving around, but I was, you know, in the Southwest still. So I, I moved to California, which is also still pretty clear, a pretty good place. Then I moved to Salt Lake, and Salt Lake is not as clear as often. And I found myself really suffering in terms of how many images I was producing per year. So I found myself in Salt Lake not really capable of putting in as much time into images myself and producing images just because it's cloudy all the time. And you know, at that point I recognize a need for, I should maybe be considering a different place to shoot from if I'm going to be doing astrophotography full time or, you know, trying to produce images full time. So at that point, I, uh, I started working with remote observatories and I ended up moving one of my rigs out. And now at this point in Salt Lake, I was running everything remotely and I'm getting, you know, the same 290, 300 clear nights per year that I would enjoy in Phoenix. So it really just comes down to, can you actually use this expensive thing you've purchased? And there is a threshold where it becomes not so much worth it 
for you economically, like if you're living in these specific spots, like if you're living in Phoenix, if you're living in LA, if you're in New Mexico, probably, if you're in the desert Southwest, it makes less sense for you to have a remote observatory because you basically live in the place where they are anyways, you know what I mean? So you're not going to enjoy as much benefit. But once you get to a point where you're maybe seeing 150 clear nights per year, 120, 100, then it starts to really, the cost of your own equipment begins to add up per night as far as how much you actually use it. You could just see way more cost reduction just by moving your stuff to a place where you can use it more and then you can get more value out of this expensive thing that you bought. So that's the, that's the idea and the thing you should think about is what kind of value are you getting with an expensive astrophotography rig from where you're living? And if you're not living in the right spot, you might barely be getting any value out of it. And that's just how it is. Astrophotography depends on where you live. There's a reason that the VLT isn't in Ohio. There's a reason they're all in Chile. They're in the Canary Islands. These telescopes, this is ridiculous. These telescopes aren't located in bad spots. <laughs> so the first reason, you know, just purely economics, you need to consider how much value you're extracting out of this expensive thing you bought. And that's kind of, you know, that's the boring side of astrophotography. But if you were wanting to do this and you're like serious about doing it, then everyone is limited by their costs. You don't want like an expensive paperweight sitting in your house or in your garage somewhere in boxes. You know what I mean? It's just, it's wasteful and something you should think about. The second reason comes in with the possibilities that are there when you have that many clear nights per year. If you had 290 clear nights per year, that's what, like almost six times 300? You have almost 1800 hours in a year potentially to produce images. And just think, what could you do with that time? What kind of things could you create? The possibilities are pretty endless as to the things you could do, you know? big projects, deep projects, discovering new nebula, doing huge mosaics. You know, the world's kind of your oyster when you have the time there. You don't even need like super fancy gear to do incredible things with that amount of time. Like, yeah, a lot of people use Takahashi's or plane waves, but I mean, with a normal, like a starter telescope, or even a camera lens, what could you do with that amount of time? You know, there's a whole host of creative possibilities that you have just because you have the time to do it. And that is the other main reason is because the types of images I want to produce, I can't do them if I'm only getting like two clear nights per week. That's just not enough time. If you want to put down like 200 hours on a target, then, <laughs> and you don't want to do it over the course of like three years, then you need a lot of time. So that's, that's the other main reason. The type of images that I want to shoot, which are big mosaics, are very difficult to do either from a backyard or just by traveling and i haven't even mentioned traveling to dark sky sites if you ever consider traveling to dark sky sites to shoot it adds up in cost really rapidly because you're paying for gas you're paying for food to camp you know you're out from home you're probably not getting work done whatever the work is all of these different costs and the time spent, the driving, that adds up. And it, you just cannot do it very often. What, if you say you do this once a month, you spend a weekend once a month to shoot from dark skies. That limits you to what, uh, like two nights most, which would maybe give you 15 hours in LRGB on an image if you're not doing narrowband and you're just doing LRGB from a dark sky site. You can produce some very excellent images in that amount of time, That not to knock anyone. There's a lot of possibilities with 15 hours, but imagine what you could do with like 50 hours. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's things that you just can't do with only 15 hours, no matter what telescope you have. Considering the cost, the possibilities, it doesn't make sense as much to do it in a place that's cloudy for me. If you're in a place that's clear, then it's probably, you know, it doesn't make as much sense to use a remote observatory because you're still getting that value, that efficiency, you're getting the hours in with your telescope. So as long as you're getting time in, 
that's important. If you're not using your telescope and you're not getting time in, then that's where, you know, you're losing out on the value you could be getting from this thing that you bought that was probably pretty expensive. So yeah, those are, <laughs> those are pretty much the reasons in total. Yeah, it's a, uh, if you can, if you look at it by the hour, it just, it ends up being more expensive. The other part of this equation we're not looking at are uh, telescope hosting services, like a uh, telescope live sky gems i think there's some other ones too but i honestly i don't even factor those things into my equation because they're way more expensive than having your own telescope somewhere because the rental rates for a scope like that would maybe be like i don't know it can get pretty high like a hundred dollars per night and if you're looking at the cost of hosting your own telescope it's only going to be like 20 to 30 dollars a night to actually host your scope somewhere. So just looking at the cost one-to-one, -one, it makes zero sense if you have the, the instruments to use Telescope Live or any of those services. Um, I would only look at those as emergency, <laughs> like you need to shoot this thing now, there's a comet or something type services because then it becomes valuable. Or if you can't afford any instruments at all, like if you can't afford a telescope to begin with, then those things maybe become affordable. But Certainly not in the long run. In the long run, the most e efficient way to go about this for cost for how much time you're imaging something, the most efficient way is to have your own scope, your own observatory technically, which is very hard to do, but your own scope hosted at a location. And that's how you're going to get the most value possible. I want to like break the notion that you need super premium gear to do remote observing or anything like that. You could, you know, if you had a cheap telescope, and a, a simple mount and an okay camera, you could be getting so much more out of your time than if you're living somewhere where you're barely using it, you know what I mean? The things that are possible with an introductory telescope are pretty insane. You just need to have the time to do it, is the thing. How many hours can you point it at the sky? That's that's really the most important thing. So yeah, this is just my astrophotography journey. This is how it's going, but I hope this has given you some food for thought to think about. You know, I want you guys to be able to use your telescopes to their highest efficiency and get the best images possible. While it's not fun to talk about the money economics of it <laughs> and that kind of thing, it's something that you have to think about. Not a lot of people are just made of money. I mean, the people who can afford plane waves, you know, it's probably less of a question, but if you're just an amateur or a, a mid-range intermediate astrophotographer, it's something that you need to start thinking about where you live. <laughs> and I get there's a lot of like life balance things about that too. You can't just move yourself somewhere where it's good to take photos, you know. People have lives and you can't just expect a hobby to you know, take precedence over someone's life and have them move somewhere where it's better to shoot astrophotography. And uh, that's one of the great things about remote observatories is you don't have to just move to Phoenix to be able to do it uh, very well, you know, but something to think about. How much are you actually using your telescope and what kind of things could you do if you had more time? That's kind of the rabbit hole that I went down. So I hope you found this helpful. I hope it gave you something to think about. We'll catch you all in the next one.